classic stories, and somebody brought up Dorian's Funko Pop. <laughs> what? Dorian Gray's Funko Pop instead of a portrait of Dorian Gray. You know the oh yeah, they're going to do a an Funko, updating a of Funko it. Pop slowly aging, which is a terrifying thought. But, but it'll be a website too, or a social media post. It'll be a profile that he <laughs> keeps trying to avoid on social media. Uh, <laughs> oh man. I'm amazed somebody hasn't done the social media Dorian Gray thing, yeah. right? Where you have the picture, like, cause that, that is, you could play with that dynamic, right? Where it's like, oh, you have pictures of him on Instagram or whatever, but he can't look at them <laughs> or something <laughs> like that or else it's going to kill him. <laughs> That's so stupid. I can't believe it hasn't been done already. Max, let's get on it. Okay. If anybody's stupid enough to do it, it's us. Yes. We'll do it right after this episode of. Oh, wait. Can oh. I? Yeah. There's a spectator haunting over Europe. The spectator film podcast. I'm what the sorry. hell was that? That that was a communism joke. Because today we're do- on the spectator film podcast. We're doing the yeah Soviet film The V. No, or well, I guess I can't correct you. Yeah, I was gonna say the V. The V. The V. I don't know where you got that from. I guess it just matters about as much as me thinking it's pronounced the V. That's yeah. our, this is our decision, folks. You're going to have to live with it. Um, the real, th- like, misfortunate thing about this is when we pronounce it, regardless of how we say it, it's probably, unless you're a certain type of person, uh, it's probably not well known enough for you to understand what we're talking about, aside from our mispronunciations. Yeah, you we're know not talking mean? about V for Vendetta. I'm yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to recognize what you're, what we're talking about, maybe. So let's clarify. The V is a Soviet horror movie. The first, and as far as I can tell, the only Soviet horror movie. Uh, I also know it has a different title called Spirits of Evil, but fuck that, because it's stupid. Um, Well, the V is just the title of the story it's adapted after. Yes, the Gogol story. Yes. Um, So maybe you're a fan of Gogol. Maybe that's where you remembered it from. Well, guess what? They made a movie of it. It's the only Soviet horror movie. Uh, this is my choice this week. Why did I choose this? I don't know. Um, it's weird. I felt like it'd it be is very like, weird. <laughs> it's like it'd be a good. I felt like it was good to like diversify our movie choices, and this is such an oddball that it's like, yeah, nobody's gonna search this on iTunes, so this will get like ten listens all time. But you know what? It'll just, just weird enough to satisfy like looking at the gallery of movies we've done, be like, yeah, we've done some different interesting things. And, and this there's, an there's going to be that movie. one person who's just like, fucking finally, somebody is talking about the V in a podcast. Yeah, you can find some things on, I actually haven't searched podcasts for this. Maybe if I listen to some after this and just feel bad about how shitty this episode is going to be. <laughs> but uh, only with that attitude. Right. Maybe I'll add some in the show notes if I find good ones. But as far as I can tell, this movie you know, is marginally talked about on the internet. Again, it's, it's a weird ass cult movie. Um, that's, you know, objectively like different and conspicuous. It is the only Soviet horror movie. It is. So it's going to get attention, but it's only from a like specific community. Yeah. I was reading some criticism of this movie, um, at the time, because I didn't, there's not much uh, record of Soviet reception to the movie other than the fact that it did very well. Yeah. A lot of people saw it. Yeah. Um, but from at least from a Western perspective, there's no history. In, there's a there's a bit of criticism. Like some people said, it was outdated for the time it came out, and the special effects were laughable for the time, even that it was made. Um, but criticism, as time has gone on, has been much more favorable to this movie that I've seen. Right, and I think that's a. I mean, those quote unquote outdated effects are a lot of what gives it that staying power. Yeah, um, and I think. You know, it's it's going to be a challenge, I think, to talk about in a few ways, despite how like interesting it is. There's not there is an abundance of things to jump into with this movie. But I was thinking about this, and I think there's going to be several things that will pose a challenge to, to us talking about this, and we'll try to piece it together throughout the course of the commentary. So the first thing is that there is going to be that cultural barrier, and it might be amplified by the fact that this movie is weird even for the Soviet yeah like film market even at that time. So it, it, it is going to pose a challenge to us, although we have certain ideas that we're going to develop throughout the commentary. Um, but the second thing is that I don't think this is like a flawless movie. I think it has some like 
it's some sloppiness in the editing and structure. Yeah. And that kind of also amplifies the cultural barrier you have to get over because you're like, is that, is are they deliberately trying to make me feel a certain way about these characters or is that just like they, that's like an error or a shortcoming in the well, film? Well, yeah, I'm going to let you get to your third point. Uh, I think that was it. Okay, because I was going to say this is if, our listeners are at all familiar with any Soviet filmmaking. And I think that you need to watch at least some Soviet films if you want to get. Yeah. Into. I'm sure plenty of people will be familiar with the, uh, silent film the era silent, stuff. And yeah, then so maybe some Tarkovsky stuff, stuff, but Man there's still the plenty of good camera, other ones. Battleship Potemkin, like the, yeah. the essentials, obviously people need to watch. Um, but this isn't really a socialist realist film no. to a degree. And it's a, bit of a departure from a lot of movies at the same time. Yeah. Not that those are, but like, no, it's not, but I'm saying movies that made in the Soviet union at the time, because it was a nationalized film industry. Yes. A lot of them had the socialist realism yeah, themes throughout of it. And this is a bit of a departure from that. So it come in and it makes it hard to talk about it in terms of filmmaking as a whole in the country. Right. And also just because there's such a, there was such a um, control over cultural exchange, you know, and also because I think a lot of those socialist realist movies are just not very engaging. No, they're, they're, <laughs> they're just propaganda. They're very long winded propaganda of how great our ideology is and, yeah. and how you should listen to. And, how, you know, that was a big portion of their production stuff for a long time. And I think, you know, uh, we'll talk about it during the movie, but this period in which this movie was made coincides with like an opening up generally of both the Soviet Union at, or Soviet Union. Um, what was I going to say? I completely lost my fucking train of thought. An opening up? Oh, of... opening up um, of uh, the Soviet Union at large and uh, their film industry more specifically, right? Their cultural yeah. industries. So they're opening up a little bit and and sort of re-engaging with... with not just their own ideas, right? And ideas within their own country that can challenge or just, you know, sub- throw out ideas that are different than the party line, but also different countries as well. Um, so there's more of like a rejuvenation of the culture going on at this time. But also like... I mean, this is yeah, pre-Glasnost, pre-Perestroika, but still like it's the Soviet Union slowly getting less it's it's after Stalin it's after Khrushchev it's them slowly letting go of the totalitarianism that was known for for a lot of the 40s and 50s but or at least letting go of the same type of it yeah yeah so you know there's some cultural shifts going on and that's probably results in why this movie was able to get made at this time but again there's such the contrast between how much like information there is on this movie and like the cultural specificity of it does make it, I think, a challenge to engage with, but not like something that you should just dismiss. Because it is really, I think, on its own terms, it is still engaging oh, and to if, watch. If we want to go into this movie like without any like historical context, out any filmmaking thing, it is kind of just fun to, <laughs> to yes, watch. Yes, that definitely helps as well. I think the huge part of the longevity and the reason why... Um, I watched this movie for the first time in 2017, as I did with many, many horror movies. But again, I think the ones that stand out in my memory from that time, I feel more likely to revisit because it's like, oh man, if it stands out against the just the field. A thousand other yeah, movies. It's like, wow, that's interesting. And I think a big thing about this is, one, it does not overstay its welcome. And two, it is very irreverent and funny. And, um, you know, despite any other sort of you know, shortcomings we might have with the filmmaking craft or questions of like ideology or anything like that. Um, or just like the skill of the storytelling. I think that tone is enough to carry it through, through it's like 73 minutes or whatever. It yeah, is. no, it's, it's very short, which helps. Um, what was the first time you watched this movie? Was it? Yeah. Okay. Was so, it like last year? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> if we, if we want a little behind the scenes, Max, Let's come clean. Yeah, okay. So we tried to do this episode like last year at some point. Um, it was a bad episode. We did not do a good job on it. Um, I think it was pro- I, I forget what happened, but I'm pretty sure it was my fault and I just was not prepared to do a commentary on this. In the official records, we always list it as your fault. Yeah, well, I know. I'm trying to remember what actually happened though. Um, what are you talking about? That is... Okay. Um, but continue, please. Yeah, so 
this was something that that episode was very bad, but this movie was interesting enough where we decided to put a pin in it and that we would do it later down the line. And now we're doing it. So yes, I watched this movie for the first time last year in preparation for an episode. Um, I found it interesting, baffling and kind of hilarious. Um, I, I do enjoy it a lot. Um, I think it drags a little bit toward the end, but yeah, I would agree for the most part. I think it's fun. I think half of my enjoyment from this movie is just, wow, this is strange and weird. And half of it <laughs> comes from just like, oh, how did they get this past this? Like, what is the context of this? Yeah, there's so many questions. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's based off of a story from Stalin's favorite author. So, like, you can always hold that up as, like, how he managed to sneak some things through the censors. Yeah, but that is one potential answer we're probably going to come back to multiple times. Yeah. But, but um, other than that, yeah, I don't have that much history with the movie or the director at large. So it's Yeah, I've seen no other... Uh, movies by the director also we should probably preface before we like jump into the movie when we say director we say we're referring mostly uh to the guy um alexander petushko yes with like a p Petushko. like in like pteranodon yes yeah anyway um so we're probably referring to him when we think like refer to this movie's like authorship hey why can't you hear attack hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom because you can't hear it P. Because the P is silent. Oh, that's really great. I know, right? Thank okay, you. go on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, god damn. You're, you really killed me with that. I'm and I'm glad. okay, okay just letting everybody sit in silence so they can deal with the consequences. Anyway, uh, so we're probably referring to him when we think of authorship and just the director of this, because he was the guy who... Well, he wrote we, we it. tribute. Yeah, he was. I think there's several writers, and then there's several writers, and then there's several directors. There's two credited directors of uh, Konstantin Yershov. Oh, and don't even try. <laughs> Georgi Kropov. Yeah, Kropyov. Right. Um, so these people, yes. and the point is that he is the guy who we can probably safely confer authorship upon with this movie where he was the guy behind the special effects. He's re been referred to, um, you know, depending on different conversations as like the Soviet, uh, Spielberg or Soviet Harryhausen or even Soviet. Um, Oh God, what's the last name? Disney. Yeah. The Soviet Disney. So all those things at various different times people have called him. Um, and he's, oh, yeah, he was an animator, wasn't he? Yeah. He, he is part of an older guard in terms of Soviet filmmaking, which might also change the way we decide to look at this movie. But really, I think the, the good way to go into this movie is, you know, expecting a fun romp and just accepting that as like a genre piece, it's not going to perfectly fit together any sort of like subtext that you might find really satisfying, you know? Um, I don't think this is a movie that offers a ton subtextually, even though there is stuff there as there always will be with any movie, but it still works in spite of that. And uh, yeah, I just really enjoy revisiting it. And I'm glad that we're, that we're branching out Actually, once again. Um, <laughs> what? Just a side little thing. Um, I have in a small way seen other films by this director. Oh my God. I think I know what you're about to say. So, um, heavily re-edited versions of some of his movies during his fantasy period um, were shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, The Magic Voyage of Sinbad, The Sword yeah, the sword and the Dragon, and The Day the Earth Froze. Uh, oh my god. Oh yeah, we should also mention that we're going to watch this on YouTube. Yeah. But the reason I said oh my god is because that was in the suggested video centered in. Yes, this. but um, those are mainly on mystery science theater because they're terribly re-edited and the English dubbing of them is just fucking awful. And it says less about him as a filmmaker more than yeah. it does of just like this butchering of his original works. Not that the original films were great, but like they were not mystery science <laughs> theater 3000. Better. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause we should really mention, we're going to watch this on YouTube because you cannot, I, at least I cannot find this in region a, whether yeah. it's online or on a disc or something. Abolish regions. Make everything region free so people can share cultures and enjoy each other's works. 
Max, we'll talk about it later, okay? I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, so we're, this is the version we're going to watch. I'm going to link to it in the show notes. So if you want to watch along with us, you can watch this video. I do not know what cut this is or if there are different cuts available or whatever the deal is. This is the movie as it exists for me. And I think I've only ever watched this YouTube video as a version of it. So if there's another cut, I have not been able to find out information that that exists or anything like that. As far as I can tell, this is the movie as it has existed and existed when it first premiered. If we somehow have some listeners in, uh, either in Eastern Europe or from Eastern Europe who have like knowledge of different cuts of this movie or like even yeah, more widely produced versions that are different than this one, we'd be glad to hear that. Oh, but. also, you know what? Let's clarify twice. We are not talking about the stupid ass V movies that have come out in the past 10 years with the second one that is starring Arnold goddamn Schwarzenegger and Jackie Chan. Oh yeah. Put the, what the hell is that? Put a link to that trailer in the show notes too. <laughs> oh, oh God. I don't want to do marketing for these people. That's already probably made. If you, if you want to look at, look up that stuff, you can, it's really weird to see Arnold and having being like dubbed with like Russian, <laughs> uh, the trailer is awful, needless to say, and I think people do not like the first V movie. From what I could tell just Googling it, I, I saw people seeing that it was like some weird, like, again, taking like, like more of a propaganda stance against Ukrainians or something. I know nothing about the new V movies except that it looks more like a Van Helsing Yeah, knockoff. no, we're watching the 60s one. Yeah, so, so this is the real V, okay? Uh, so look up for the one in, in 1967. Uh, and yeah, do you have anything else you want to add before we jump in? Uh, no, let's just, let's get going comrades. Let's enjoy this great celebration of the socialist worker. I don't know if it's that, but it's not at all. Yeah. Let's go. go. Let's go. Look at the look at the statue. Look at the heroic Those are real workers. People. Yes, yes. You should be seeing the Moss Film logo. Moss Film's still around today. I don't know if they made the new one though. I'm not. I mean, based on the quality of the sequel trailer that you showed me, it looks like a state funded film. Almost. I don't know if it's been privatized since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, who knows. But here's here's the first answer in our clue, right? So one of the things we were that I said that wrong. The first clue to getting an answer in terms of like how this movie was marketed or how it got past censors. Yes. I mean, we'll talk about this, but like there's a reason why this movie is weird for the Soviet Union and um like you were saying when we did the sort of not pre-screening, but when we talked about this beforehand, it's like you know, there's the Soviets have a specific relationship to what they deem as like mysticism. Yes. So like in terms of this movie's beginning, okay, what does it bill itself as? It does begin with the direct quote from the beginning of the story from Gogol. So maybe that's part of it, right? Maybe it can like survive some type of censorship at this point in time in Soviet history because it is also sufficiently reverent to Gogol. And it, I know it is a very faithful adaptation too. Of the story. Yeah. If you were taking too much, yeah, liberties with the original thing, then yeah, the censors be, might come down on you. But. Yeah, especially since it is a movie that is a horror movie, and it's so fantastic in that specific way, right? So maybe that's part of it. Maybe the prestige of, like, it being a Gogol adaptation is something that was, like, kept the censors because you can't like if you're a censor in the Soviet Union and then you're just like oh well you can't make this story it's against these ideologies and somebody comes back to you with like oh you're saying that what Stalin liked wasn't in line with our ideology then people oh, no never yeah <laughs> it's to be or not to be 100% of the time it's like exactly that scene where he's like I do never trust a man who doesn't eat meat doesn't smoke doesn't drink yeah you're talking about our Fuhrer? <laughs> no, no, I would never. No. Why, why should I ruin you? You, you should watch uh, The Death of Stalin. I know you haven't seen it yet. But oh, it's, yeah, I am looking forward to it. It's, it's got a good cast. It's so funny. Um, I haven't seen a better black comedy in such a long time. But. Now, while we don't have a clear answer to how this movie was marketed and conceived in terms of um, that sort of thing, to understand how it was sort of at play at this time, I think the opening of this movie is very visually clear about 
some of the things going on. So we get that panning, like tilting shot, excuse me, <laughs> tilting shot down from this monastery to this ruckus out here, right? And I think the verticality of the that shot and the monastery really reinforces like visually the idea of it being this like institution, right? Very much so. That's the thing. Like you have two kinds of mysticism yes. in this movie. You have the organized mysticism as represented by the church. Yeah. Um, which even like our main characters are supposed to be religious, but it's pretty clear they're not really adherent to that ideology. Well, it it's secularized kind of. Yeah. It's like a belief system, but it's not like something that they follow with like religious fervor. They yeah. like the degree to which they behave um sort of zealously toward their religion doesn't seem to exist. You know what I mean? They could be schoolboys and this could be them saying the pledge of allegiance or whatever. Yeah. You know? It's oh, the same sort our first, of like our lead character. It's like a dutiful, like, okay, we have to do this, but yes. like, it's not, there's no passion in it. Whereas you have the opposite of the witch's mysticism. Right. Which is something she, she's it's, very it's, passionate. Yeah, it's more rooted in that type of like zealous occultism. Yes. And both of them are frivolous and will lead to nothing in the end. Yeah. Also, this movie kind of has a bit of an anti promiscuity, anti sex message, but we'll get into that in a bit. Yeah. Although, like, I, it's, there's so, so many questions with this movie about its attitude towards everything. Obviously, it's showing us they have this decadent attitude, right? But I guess here was, this can lead us into the main question for me when I was watching this and preparing for this episode. Oh, by the way, here we get a lot of just casual, like, abducting abducting women. Also, nobody will care about this, but her scream is a Foley scream that I have heard a million times and just made me give me, gave me so many questions about like, you know, did they redub this in like the U S did the Soviet union have access to that Foley scream? That Foley scream is as old as 1967. I mean, you see the the Wilhelm scream and different things all over the world. So that came up in like the fifties, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Still, but I'm saying cowboy show, a guy got like bit by an alligator or something, (laughs) but yeah. So, I think the point you were making in terms of um, the institution, right? Yes. Of uh, the the church is that it's kind of, that one is a neutered demystification, right? That one is the normal. Yeah. And the, the Cossack village is the actual mysticism in this. But then when it's treated that way by the movie, that's a beautiful shot, by the way, just the silhouettes of them walking. I love some of the imagery in this, but well, when it, no, this, Oh my God, like the spooky, the uh, fog as they're walking through this dark, cold air. Like I, I, I do like a lot of the shots in this movie. Yeah, the quality of this transfer is just absolutely terrible. It's but garbage. There's but, like, some it still really looks beautiful good. stuff yeah. that comes through still. Um, even though you can tell a lot of it is on a set and it's artificial, it's kind of like, oh, you know, it still has this charm and like beauty to it. But anyway, in terms of the institution, right? Yes. Let's just get this out of the way. So one is secularized, more normal. And the other is the real mist of like mystical community. But when you have something like that in this movie, it then just creates the like church that they're in the seminary school as like a placeholder for just generic institution. Right. And then this reads into like the question of subtext in this movie. So we have an institution and we have people who are a part of it and they're going to be tested throughout the course of this movie. So what is this movie subtextually really saying about that th- like thing, you know? And is the institution that they're talking about like the Soviet Union at the time? Or what is it saying about like, what is it implying through subtext about these things? And it's never really clear, but I came up with like two major possibilities. The first one would be that given the recent shifts in Soviet society where they shift out of uh, the Khrushchev era into like the early Brezhnev era, there's like that greater emphasis on like, like developed socialism, I think they called it. And by the way, I gathered this from the most cursory like research about well, this period yeah, of time. Well, because if for a brief, 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 brief history of the Soviet Union, just relevant to this time frame, after Stalin's death, you had Khrushchev assume power and Khrushchev, his main political goals was the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union. So right. trying to... Re- relax things from Stalin's insanity, trying to open things up a little, but he was more focused on domestic policy because he was trying to make Russia better and then would spread it to the rest of the Soviet Union. He was 
eventually ousted and replaced with Brezhnev, who yeah. focused more on opening it up in general as the Soviet Union. Not as far as Gorbachev, but... Sure. Yeah. Point is, you increase, you relax the control yeah. on everything, and it becomes more of an open system. And also, the thing that came with that is greater, like, consumerist policies, yeah. right? So I think part of the thing was, in my first thoughts on this, was like, oh, is this the older filmmaker, Patishko, who was part of a generation of Soviet filmmakers in, like, the first wave of filmmaking from, like, the 30s, who really yeah, he zealously... Was born, he was born before the revolution, wasn't yes. he? Yes. Um, his first, like his first major movies internationally were like from the thirties. He did yeah. one of like Gulliver's travels, but like the point is he's part of that first wave, which very zealously hold on to those ideas of like the revolution and that spirit right yeah. in, in the system. That well, he in. was 18 when the revolution happened. Yeah. Like he, he was in full swing. Sure. For it. Um, but then you have this generational secularization, right? And this church in this movie is secularized and these kids don't have those convictions. They don't care, but they are hedonistic and they are like quote unquote decadent in that way. They're just after to get everything right. And they're rascals and they're only looking out for themselves, you know, and this institution is perhaps shown to be vulnerable because of that. And perhaps we can read this as being like, Oh, our main character is vulnerable because he does not have those convictions. Or there's the other way, okay. which I thought about, which is that, oh, this movie is actually more pro-Soviet kind of propaganda, but not condemning the consumerist actions so much as it is like overindulgence in it, where it's like, oh, if you engage in the consumerism at the expense of your convictions, then you are a, like, you are You're vulnerable. Damned. Yeah. Um, and very much that's something that goes on throughout this movie is like the question of fate for this character they talk about a few times. I Look. think these cuts are hilarious, by the way. <laughs> the symbolic cut of the cow chewing and just cutting to our main character. But I mean, like, look at that attitude towards our main character. This is one of the confusing things about this movie is like, does it like him? It plays like a morality play, except it's showing how shitty all these kids are in this guy in particular. Yeah. He just kicked that pig. What the fuck was that? For no real reason. And I mean, you could track that all throughout like the character engagements we've seen so far. He's an asshole. He's the only one not saying the prayer at the beginning. Um, he's a dick to everybody. He tries to leverage some sort of social status on this woman saying, you'll be rewarded if you let us in. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, he's an asshole. But specifically too, when he leverages status, he's privileged. So he's privileged, he's decadent. We should pause to talk about this scene. Not now, it's the time of Lent. I would not let that's you a, That's me. another thing um, in my review of the whatever criticism is available for this movie. Um, apparently, at the time of the Soviet Union, there was a strong push for the anti-promiscuity and people trying to just be faithful to one partner and not have sex out of wedlock and all that whatnot. Um, so apparently a common reading of this movie is you have the two people punished for their promiscuity in different ways. You have, so, cause if we're reading this in a sexual way where the movie, you can't really not yes. read it in a sexual way. Cause we have him saying that, she's trying to seduce him and it's just the act and the yeah. way it's shown. He yeah. lit she literally is riding Dominates him. him yeah. yeah. Um, but they're both punished. They're both punished for it. her immediately by her brutal stick death. Um, and then him, and then him throughout the course of the rest of the film. Through, right. Uh, cause he doesn't admit that he was in the wrong and perhaps both of their different varieties of like decadence or sin, yes. so to speak has led them to be pun like punished themselves in this way. By the way, just got to pause to say how fun that set is, the rotating set as he's taking off. But also, like, the interesting thing about this is just, like, this is, w like, where the attitude towards his character runs into qu real questions for us because we're, like, this does have undertones of, like, sexual violence and domination that is not desired by this guy. Yeah. And it is weird to watch this, and it does make you, I don't want to say, like, problematic, uncomfortable feelings, but you're like, oh, my God, that's, like... This was not in the tone of what I've been watching the last 10 minutes, right? Oh, good Lord. She's a witch. You're just figuring that out now. <laughs> but, um, 
Yeah. It is weirder that she turns into a hot woman after she dies. Well, that's the other thing is like, so she is our first introduction to this Cossack society, even though yeah. we don't know it yet. And it is introduced with what? The greater, the, the representation of mysticism in this movie, but it's also female, but like doubly female. It's an old woman who, by the way, is played by a man in this. Yes. So as to appear more weird, you know, disquieting, and yeah, and, and like ugly. Yes, it reinforces the ugliness because it, when you cast the man, it is not there to, in any sense, uh, like appeal to like a well, heteronormative yeah. gaze. And, and, and her appearance wise, she's very clearly based off of the Russian myth of Baba Yaga, but um, yeah, just creepy old witch minus the chicken legs, unfortunately. Right. But, but again, the, the idea of that is like when you're doing that, you're, it's not that it's done like without consideration for the male gaze. It's done specifically to make it coded for like repulsive yeah. and horrifying. So it is very much pathologizing like women and also kind of pathologizing like sexuality, but like female sexuality kind of. Um, although I, I was reading an interesting article talking about how maybe that is not nuanced enough of a reading, but we'll get to that. Um, no, I, yet again, that was just a yeah thing I found. That but the found interesting thing about that is that's definitely something that comes up when you look into Gogol. I'm not yeah. an expert on Russian literature in general and definitely not Gogol. I think he's a neat writer and some of the qualities that come through in this movie are one, his sort of like pre Kafka esque, I might call it like sense of bureaucracy and things going on in a type of absurdity. I'm not familiar enough with his work to comment on that. But that yeah. Would be he's got a lot of like stories like that, that are sort of, we'll call them semi, um, uh, what is the word that we always, Not parable. What is the word? Paramount? No, 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 no. Parrots? Not analogy, but what's the other one? Analogous? No. <laughs> parable, analogous. What's the fucking word? It's not a metaphor, but it's... Uh, analogy? Um... No, it's not analogy. <laughs> We're going to figure this out like half an hour from now. God damn it. I can't believe I'm forgetting this word. Oh, well, let's... Animal Farm. What is it? <laughs> What's the genre of Animal Farm? Um, bad? I don't know. Point is, it, it uses that type of storytelling, right? And he does it in absurd bureaucratic ways that reveal this weird type of bureaucracy about the yeah. system. That's a common thing. And he's even an asshole there. He puts his fucking feet in the guy when he's washing the floor. Point is, that's something that comes through. But the other thing that comes through and something a lot of critics have talked about in reference to Gogol and to this story as it's written specifically is Gogol is for some reason incredibly afraid of women. Uh, <laughs> he is mortified about them. He seems yeah. to not like them and find them just terrifying. Uh, yeah, I don't know what, what was what was up with that. I'm not I'm enough of an expert, but you can tell if you read a number of his stories. Um, well, there are a lot of authors like that, but like sometimes you kind of get where they're coming from. Right. Like, but also it's like pathologize, like he pathologizes them. Like it's like, he's insanely afraid of them. Well, it's so, weird. Well, so is Tennessee Williams. If you want to like read some sure. classic authors, but I, but I sure guess that's when I think gay. of Tennessee Williams, that's the other thing people like yeah. to speculate about his sexuality because of this. Yeah. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Point is that's definitely something that comes through and the feminine and the feminine sexuality, those two things are linked in a way that like makes them other and weird. So is that something that's associated with the mysticism and specifically this other society that he's going to have to go into? The other things that's interesting about this is how like, maybe you can read this if you're going with the first option of them criticizing the society as a whole, you see this like stratification of the society that you might read as coming along with more consumerism. Yeah. So they're talking about the exchange of goods right now, right? And how that dictates how people are treated. He's, he's sending our, our lead character coma is his name to this Sotnik who we do not yet know is the father of that young woman that he hit. Right. Um, he's sending them to the Sotnik to do the funeral rites, not because he thinks he's like the good student or whatever. It's because the guy is fucking wealthy and, and he, he said asked so. for him yes. by name. And he's like, well, that's enough for me. It has nothing to do with conviction. It has everything to do with like material possessions. Right. 
have some vodka before they leave. This is... A, if I had to choose a branch of Christianity, it would probably be Eastern Orthodox. They seem like they know how to have fun, at least. What makes you say that? They still like to drink as much. They're, it's not forbidden for uh, patriarchs or... Allegorical! They ask, oh my God, yeah. we, use, we overuse that word constantly. I well, guess. I think we try to avoid using that word. We're just fried today, folks. Yeah. Sorry, I know all of you knew that word immediately. Maybe I'll add that in the background. <laughs> Somebody screaming. But yes, yeah, so again, he uses semi-allegorical, and that's something that I think pops up in this movie. It definitely has like a strong folk story type of feel. And the, you know, those types of stories or fables or things like that always rely on a type of allegorical element, you know, even if they are not literally allegory in of themselves. They're taking stock characters and they're putting them into a situation and, you know, they're kind of uh, moralizing and didactic about a specific idea or thing. By the yeah. end. You get a moral at the end. Um, and I think this movie definitely feels that way. Um, but yes, yeah, so he's being, again, his autonomy is now being restricted by the system he's in, like where he was trying to leverage some sort of status on the old woman to get in to sleep. He's now having status leveraged against him in a very specific way for like maybe consumer related reasons. Right. And that's something that I was reading the first time I watched this is like, oh, maybe this movie is like not on board with the society. But maybe it could also be the other option and it's just criticizing a higher level of that society. You know, maybe it's saying, oh, the, the guy who's in charge is also too wrapped up in this thing to recognize the danger of this very wealthy man, you know? Kind of, but also it's kind of implied that, like, even the higher up guy wouldn't give two shits. Like, he's fine with giving away this problematic Yes, yeah, I mean, that's student. the other question. We don't ever see him do something that, like, demonstrates true conviction, you know? Like, it's not like we know for a fact that he he takes everything more seriously because he believes more than the students or just because it's more beneficial to him. And that's just his role in life, you yeah. know, God, proboscis monkey. All these people look like just proboscis monkeys. To I, me, I would I say know. more walruses than anything, but I, I do love the hearty Russian <laughs> mustaches and facial hair. Oh God. I just do love the silliness of this movie. He's just constantly trying to escape. Yeah. And they're just like, Oh, what are you talking about? Come here. Brother philosopher, as they call him. And, uh, this is probably a good time to start bringing up some stuff with like class differences. As well, we see the Cossack village is definitely being part of a different class. I would say not only because they're shown to like not have experience with education or also they're shown to be illiterate too. Um, the guy tries to read the book and he's like, oh, don't do that, right? Yeah. But also they're away, like they're outside of Kiev. Also, I'll stop myself. Three cranes in that nest. One thing I noticed that was interesting and weird, and I don't know how to relate that specific image to this, is that there's like a repetition of like threes in this movie. You have the three cranes. You also have the three people at the beginning. You have the three knights. Uh, you have, when he gets drunk, he sees the guy three times. <laughs> you know, it's like all sorts of little details. And I guess... I'm not quite sure how to work that into a reading of this movie, um, but it does give it a type of like folk tale type feeling to me where there's yeah. like a certain repetition of elements that just happens over and over again because that's just part of the structure of those types of stories. Um, but yeah, definitely we're going to see some more class <laughs> stuff start to Well, develop. it's almost like it's a different culture. It is. I mean, that's the other thing about the cultural specificity of trying to like get an idea of what this movie's subtext is, is because clearly there's like an idea of, you know, Russia, the Soviet Union in general, so big. Yeah. You know, um, there's obviously going to be different cultural cultures sort of distributed geographically in different associations with those people. And when you have a movie like this, that's, you know, playing with stock characters to try to tell like a type of allegorical story, you know, it's, Oh my God, wait a second. Is that a beer mug to his right on his right? I don't think it's a beer mug. I think it's a container it's a of fucking alcohol. tower. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so clearly this is a specific thing and they refer to themselves constantly as Cossacks, which I'm not entirely sure what that would refer to. It's a, in, in, it's an ethnic, it's a, I know it's like a yeah. Ukrainian population, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know like what the associations are with it entirely. 
oh, here's another good example of how he's shallow or whatever. What do you study in the school? He just does that cool trick with yeah. the beer on his head. Max tried to do that once with our microphones. Yeah, and that's and why we, have, we had to pause for a little bit. That's why we <laughs> have new that. microphones. Do you think he's trying to escape when he does that? Yes. It's funny. I think that's the constant joke, is that he keeps trying to casually walk away. And yeah. Then, this movie has a great sense of like slapstick where he's trying to do one thing, but like I, I think it was I was watching like a Pierre Attacks, who's like a fun French slapstick guy from the sixties, but I was yeah. watching the Criterion uh collection um box set of his stuff. And there was a interview he was saying where he's talking about like, oh, a good rule for like like slapstick stuff is like somebody's trying to do something that has a certain function, but then when they try to do it, it's just the function fucks up somehow. And that's like the principle of slapstick is like you're trying to do a table but then it's lopsided and then it's just how creative you can get with all that stuff i think this movie's great with that this is <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of the drunk sequences yeah no this is well i love because like it's very apparent that he's like it's <laughs> this is like yeah what's the term the inebriated no the the technique they're using right now it's a very obvious like early green screen. Oh, they're like compositing yeah, the, the shots together. But that's a very good, almost visual presentation of what it feels like when you're, <laughs> you're overly too drunk or you're just like, why is everything slightly too big or small? I, yeah, I think like the, I don't know if it's rear screen protection stuff. That stuff is a little bit more obvious, but also because he's drunk, it no, it's works definitely, better. As it's definitely artificial. composite. It, yeah. Composite. Yeah. I mean the three shots of the people together, the three that, and then, but like him, like, wandering around yeah. like the weird like mean streets type of shot the yeah. harvey Keitel dancing shot before yeah. that shot happened he, yeah like it it visually works very well for what they're trying to portray there yeah the girl is dead you shouldn't have spent so much fucking time getting wasted at an inn i mean we did talk about it um a little bit but we were talking over some of the good class stuff that you can maybe dig your teeth into with this movie when they're going, when they're getting drunk together. Right. Um, clearly there's still a difference in terms of how they behave and treat one another that sort of acknowledges a type of class difference, but they, <laughs> that's my favorite joke in the movie. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear it on the microphones, but there's this little dog that's like going like, <laughs> like in the village as like everybody's running around cause she's dead. And some guy is like quiet circle. The woman is dead. And the dogs are sitting there like crying into the air. Oh God. That's so funny. And it's perfect too because it just cuts to it at this like deadpan flat shot of the guy <laughs> scolding this dog. This movie has a great sense of humor. It does. It really reminds me of like the best of Sam Raimi. It, there is a lot of slapstick and just sort of like, I don't know how to pronounce like just sort of deadpan humor. Irreverence kind yeah. of, yeah. Um, oh, another interesting thing to mention like visually. I think this is a great shot because you get that obviously distinct color palette to this room, which reaffirms the mysticism of this girl, right? Yes. It's very ominous. But also I think the verticality of the candles is something that visually is like kind of geometrically uh, reminiscent of like the institution at the beginning, right? And I think it's interesting to look at the imagery of this movie and how he goes from like one church to another church and his showdown is in another church. It's like this, I, I, it really does tackle this idea of two warring ideologies, I think. And obviously, uh, Coma succumbs to, to this weird mystical yeah. ideology, which again is, you know, gendered feminine, I would say. Well, yeah, and then if you want to go back to the sex reading of that, and it's him finally getting the punishment for his transgression with, with the female. And... It's represented by her mysticism finally destroying him. Yeah. Um, well, that's the other question is like, is it that he, it's not that he transgressed per se, but like maybe he like, well, the reading his previous transgressions is like vulnerable the, to the, it. The reading I read of it is him uh, early on in the movie, like having the old woman like force herself on yeah. him is him refusing to take responsibility for his part in transgressing into it. And that's why she is visually turned into a young, attractive woman when it's over. Huh? Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that yeah. reading, but it's an interesting take on it. I don't know if I like 
I don't know. I can't like agree with that, but I don't know if it's just because I'm so uncomfortable with the idea of somebody being like accosted against their will and then blaming the person. That's such a like knee jerk reaction for me at this point. Where no, it's like, I, com- yeah. I completely agree with you on that side, but also there's the whole like, if we want to view it that way of like, cause he like demanded entry into our house. He was like, um, he did put himself in that situation. He, no, but yeah. he was like, he was like forcing himself into this woman's life. He insinuated himself into it. Yeah. And then like, it's almost like reality comes seeping back in after like the rage and the moment is over. Yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to say like, <laughs> We just have to pause and say that this lead actor, I think, despite like the cardboard, like cut out character, he is really good at like doing the faces ooh, and everything. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But he's such a like, he's such a like goofy asshole. You know, he's so good at playing like the shithead who's just like only cares about himself and doesn't give a fuck. But also he's good at doing like the nervous eyes too, <laughs> where he knows he's like, he's like up a Creek right now. And he's like, I swear to God, I've never done this. I promise you I've never done this. Yeah. Um, and he just lies whenever it suits him <laughs> in that moment. He'll G- contradict himself to lie just yeah. because it suits him in that moment. God strike me dead if I'm lying. And he's just sort of like, uh... he constantly reveals himself to just have no belief <laughs> in, in anything whatsoever. Um, except for drinking maybe. Um, but I guess the other thing about what you were saying about, you know, that sexual encounter is maybe what you're saying that is similar to what I was sort of maybe leaning to with this, where, you know, we might, regardless of whether or not we think it's like problematic, maybe we can see this movie as like being a morality play that is judging him for like his sins that would make him vulnerable. Yeah. It's sort of like a question with like Macbeth, right? One of the questions in that movie is like fate versus choice. Would Macbeth have done any of those things to try to get the crown if, if the didn't. witches hadn't, if the weird sisters hadn't fucking said anything to him? Yeah. And then there's also like the right. mysticism versus reality of like, did any of this magic prophecy actually have an impact on it? Or was that just the way things yes. were going to work or out? Or is it like, they naturally found their way to him because he was waiting. Yes. Yeah. Or would he have created his own opportunity? Obviously it's a little bit different when our lead character is the one that's attacked. But again, I think it is maybe you could say this movie doing the morality play thing where it is now punishing him for putting himself in a situation where, where he's vulnerable to that like mysticism, you know? And I think it's more trying to do a thing where it's maybe saying that that mysticism and the spectacle of that ideology, which you can also maybe say is more of a consumerist ideology because of the father's presence, right? He's the wealthy one and he has control over the entire situation because of his wealth, right? So now he's trapped here. So maybe you like the idea of him being accosted like sexually in a pseudo sexual scene is like more of a seductive thing too like where he's seduced by that behavior, which then leads to this thing, but he doesn't realize how severe it is until too late. But the movie's a little bit messy in that. And I think we're just so uncomfortable by the, by the sheer thought of like holding like the victim of like an, a sexual assault encounter, like to be guilty well, in that situation. Th- that's the thing. Though. That's outside the formal construction that's, of the movie. That's the thing. I think that reading that I'm quoting yeah. is taking it, to be like, it was more of a consensual, like, sexual encounter that they both had. And she was immediately punished for it by him because he made, yeah, she made him break his yeah, vows for Lent or whatever. Um, and then he's punished gradually for his transgression and his fusual refusal to admit his consensual part in it. Right. Um, so if we're taking it with that, she forced himself on him, then yes, there is the yeah element of that. But if we're saying that they both decided to go to together and using that reading, then I would say it's the movie. If we're are going to ascribe a position to the movie about it, which is hard to do, it's hard yeah. to pin down the movie's attitude towards it. But I would say it's a mixture of the two things. Only he did not do it consensually, but he put himself in a position for that to happen through his decadent behavior. And because he does not have actual convictions, he cannot then save himself in like the spiritual moral test he must then go through. You know, 
if he, like, I know at the end, one of the things his friend said, oh, the witch could not have hurt him if only he was not afraid of her, right? So if he ha- actually had some type of conviction or uh, faith in a belief system, right, then maybe he would have been safe, but he didn't, and therefore he was, like, consumed. So, like, I think it's a mixture of those two things, although, again, not consensual. And obviously that's, like, a different, and you know, it, outside uh, of the movie, it's, like, obviously... yeah. That's like fucking problematic as shit no, of to course. say. Like. But let's stop talking about this because we're about one, the whole, uh, I, I love the Eastern Orthodox just like. Oh, imagery in this? Yeah. It does have really great use of that. Um, I'm not sure how like culturally specific it is to like, you know, like the different region or what exact monastery this is supposed to be. I know I, I remember looking into this and seeing like the monastery in the story is actually a monastery that the Soviet Union burnt down in the thirties. Yeah. So obviously this is not shot on location there, but obviously the different churches and monasteries in this like look awesome. And there's a lot of neat like imagery that is culturally specific. And it's a shame that we do not have a better transfer of this to see some of these like cool looking sets and designs and stuff. Yeah. But, oh, like the stained glass and the, the faded paintings of saints even, in the back. Even like, as simple as like the cross on the coffin looks yeah. very culturally specific. But like the, I've never the, seen that And the before. incense waving back and forth. And yeah. The, it's, it's great. I love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're going to set up for the gauntlet of this movie, which is really when this movie starts to kick into its like folklore, I mean, for me, type of moment, when it picks up the horror and the folklore at the same time is like with the repetitive behavior really kicks in and drives the structure of the movie. But also it's like, it's a fun, it's like a paranormal thing, paranormal activity thing, right? The fun part of that movie, seeing it in the theater was like, Oh, the escalation of yeah. activity throughout this repetitive, like repetitive narrative unit of day, night, day, night. We know the scary things are going to happen now. Let's get ready and watch our friends get scared. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, I think the movie really shines there too, where, you know, obviously you can say part of this movie's appeal might be sort of enjoyment in a camp way because of it. But I think the movie is like, too smart to actually just fall into like camp and saying that it's so bad. It's good. It's not mystery science theater 3000. Yeah. yeah. Like you were saying, um, Oh, by the way, this is an interesting sort of conversation. I think in terms of like reference to like our, our discussion of like the sex act and the sexuality, right? Where I, I, one of the interesting articles I read that I'll link to and maybe quote in the show notes is talking about how maybe this is like, talking about different like levels of like an abusive sexuality too that traps him where it's like one of the things they're talking about is like how this is maybe an example of like a type of castration anxiety, which is again talking about what you're saying where like, okay, you're being punished, but the castration anxiety comes from like a type of involvement with that sexual encounter. Right. But he was dominated by this woman. And the example they're talking about is how like, Oh, this hunt huntsman who is very manly and bravado, you know, he, he was ridden by this woman and then he dried up into like a pile of ash and he was useless after. Right. And that's sort of the thing that he's trying to survive at this moment. And now it's weird because we're like, halfway through the film and now it, but like this is where the movie almost really starts is like, yeah, that's where the premise picks up. It's interesting that the first part of the movie moves so quickly. I think it is really because they're so dedicated to that irreverence and kind of slapstick spirit. Uh, you get a lot of silliness and even though it might be hard for us to tell like the degree to which the movie intends you to find something silly. Yeah. Clearly there's visual like gags and jokes throughout this movie. Well, no. Yeah. Like clearly the movie even stops at some points, like for you to be like, dun, 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 dun. like even it, when it doesn't stop yeah. the shit with the symbolic cuts with the cows. Yeah. Like it's not like a smart idea, but it's so blatant <laughs> and the actor does such a good job of just like chewing like an idiot <laughs> that it's amusing. And then, like, it's just sort of him being like, oh, yeah, well, I'll be fine. Right, guys? And them all sort of laughing, but everybody sort of knowing that he's kind of fucked. Well, 
because they were talking about how like it seems like everybody in the village d- kind of knew she was a witch. Yeah, they do seem to have a, a greater deal of solidarity with him. Yeah. Over this experience and just the fact that they were drinking together, I guess. Well, yeah, they had they had a good time at the inn. <laughs> I just love the shit that happens when he enters this church for the first time. We get the cats now, but then the amazing shit with the doves later. That's great. Yeah. I love that stuff. Even corpses fear the word of God. <laughs> you better stay there. <laughs> I'm just imagining like a priest saying this to like somebody <laughs> in like a funeral home <laughs> or something because they're really scared. That's another interesting thing too that he mentions repeatedly is like, oh, Cossacks aren't afraid. There's lots of people talking, specifically Coma, talking about what his idea of a Cossack is. Well, in the, Cossack is a historically a, like a warrior culture. They're, right. They're strong. They're strong they're manly people men. of the yeah of like the tundra. So, being a Cossack is a sense of pride for right. a lot of people. But he's also using this as like something to try to like reaffirm himself. And specifically, yeah. if you look at it in terms of like, you know the. Uh, the um, the sort of castration anxiety that comes with that weird sexual moment, you know, it could be him trying to reassert his like control over himself, right? Again, talk. This article discusses that, right? T- relating that to a type of abuse behavior, and while that's not something that I think the movie is explicitly exploring, I think it is interesting. Uh, that you can relate that here and that it's sort of appropriating that same sort of type of behavior for this story. Also, that's just a, oh God, Jesus is so angry. He looks more like <laughs> Rasputin than he does Ju- he Jesus. He furious, <laughs> yeah. He's going to fuck you up. Have you ever seen Rasputin, uh, the hammer one with Christopher Lee? No, I have not, but that sounds delightful. It's not like amazing, but it is fun to watch like Christopher Lee just like cut loose. In yeah. the, in whenever he gets an opportunity in those Hammer movies, because he's just Christopher Lee, but he's also like screaming at people and well, calling them stupid. Russ Boutin is one of my favorite historical figures, and then like just out of the pure ridiculousness and mythos surrounding him, um, and Christopher Lee is still to this day my favorite actor of all time. So that sounds like a delightful. You time. know, it'd be interesting, th- like, to do a double feature of uh, the Christopher Lee Rasputin the Mad Monk. And the far more interesting movie, The Devils, uh, by Ken Russell with Oliver Reed. Okay. Who is, it's also based on a historical event of a kind of a guy who's comparable to Rasputin. Um, this guy like Grenier, Father Grenier, who was like in the French, like, I, I don't know if they're Christian or Catholic or whatever the fuck they are. Point is, in the French church, he was like a big, like uppity the f- motherfucker. The French were still Catholics. Yeah, I think they were Jesuits. That's why he was so educated yeah. and smart and was able to manipulate people. Yeah. I think that's what it was. They fucking overeducated everybody and they became free thinkers. <laughs> but um, anyway, he, so in that movie, it's great because it's just crazy and Ken Russell and it's Oliver Reed screaming and trying to have sex with all the women that he can. <laughs> oh God, that's such a weird, crazy movie. Also, Snuff. He's doing it because he can't smoke in church. Yeah. I, as far as I can tell, that's the first time he's actually actually like followed like a doctrine. Oh, you motherfucker, you shouldn't have sneezed. Woke her up now. But am I right yeah. or wrong in that? What? Is that the first time he's actually like paid attention to some sort of regulation <laughs> according to the well, church? I think he's terrified. He does have motivation. So he's going to try to follow it as much as he can. But has to- he done it at all beforehand? Not really, no. Well, he's starting to light the candles and then like... Only when he's been trapped. Yeah. And forced to do so. So that's the first time he's been forced to do something. (laughs) It's very interesting. Oh my God, a witch, a sacred circle. I do love it in any kind of movie, regardless of the time. I love sort of like this Christian mythology that you don't get to see in a lot of movies. Oh, just like mythos of how to deal with 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 weird demons or spirits. Yeah, like and I feel like you see it so frequently. In, this is the real problem with like Hollywood movies using like Christian. Well, I don't know. I don't know what the normal mythology for like ghost possession movies is well, because so often like Hollywood just appropriates other misappropriates. We should say 
other cultures for shitty like ghost movies. Well, that's the, that's the boring stuff for me. By the way, can we just pause to say that like great miming? Yeah, this this woman, um, I think she is a really good look for this character. Um, it kind of reminds me of uh, Barbara Steele in Black Sunday a little bit. Yeah, she's not I can as see that. like maybe conspicuous looking, but she's very beautiful and kind of like she, she can like convey a sense of like power and control with her, just her eyes. And she is good at doing the miming thing. Oh, since I mentioned that, by the way, black Sunday is actually, I think based on the V as well. Really? Although very distantly. Hmm. That's a much more different movie than this. <laughs> she's going to do fist. I want to put them up, put them up. You, you dumbass. But yeah, hold on. I interrupted you. We were saying something about um, what were you just talking about? I don't know. You completely threw me off. Sorry. Oh, uh, Christian mysticism. So yeah. basically, um, <laughs> in like paranormal activity or stuff like that, when it's vague, just like, oh, Jesus, I cast you out. And yeah, that's get the that. aggravating that, shit. That's boring. I like when it's just like, okay, so it's this specific demon from this sect of hell and I have it's this vague Christian. Yeah, this vague long thing of rituals. I can I, I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's almost like it fucking just misappropriates the dominant ideology. Yeah. <laughs> like religion of the US anyway. Which I'm fu- I don't know. Oh no, he's ready to smoke in church. Or is he? Well, I think it's because the ritual is over for the night, so he can. He's still not going to, but he's tired. I think this is definitely, although I do appreciate the movie's speed, definitely the editing is a little bit clunky in this part yeah. where it's just like, oh, the night's over now. And then the daytime. And he finally is out. He is finally free and totally traumatized. <laughs> I mean, how do you react to that? To what? Just having you having to, to spend either? twelve hours like reading prayers to this witch. That's I'm fucking to... tired doing that. Like if I stayed up all night, fucking anyway. Yeah, not doing anything, not challenging your belief in how the world <laughs> works. If I was in that situation, I don't know. First of all, I draw a much bigger circle so I could fuck, and I put a chair in it so I could fucking sit down. I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> Do you think that would get me killed? There's very know. specific rules. Because what if you have to pee? But you've drawn the circle, so you're like, well, shit. Now I can't, like, go outside to use the bathroom. You've got a lot of problems. Yeah. And here's the other question. That's if the most you, important thing. If you peed on the demon, which I would assume this guy would do in that situation, because why the fuck not? Does that count as you going outside the circle? <laughs> Because if it did, you're Don't really... Don't cross the streams. Yeah, if it does, you're really in trouble because then you have to pee inside your circle and you better pray that you drew that circle wide enough or that this this church floor is not at an angle. Yeah. Because then it's just going to be awful. Then you're going to ruin your circle and it's just going to go through anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's funny how all these men do like the cartoonish, like gossipy thing. Ooh. It's so funny to me. That's the thing, like, I'm not sure if this was meant to be serious or goofy. It's just like, oh, you have all these big macho, goofy, yeah, macho, burly men, and they're like almost like a sewing circle, just like, oh, what happened? I think definitely it, it takes on that type of charm where, you know, maybe they're seen as like different or other at the start when he meets them, but, you know, as time goes they're on. They're antagonistic to him to begin yeah, with. And, then, and they're still different, They're but they're more embracing his struggle, even if it is just because they find it salacious. And then this character, I'm not really sure what to make of how this movie feels about this character. Other than that, he's just completely. Well, I I think he's conflicted. Like, I don't know. Like, I think you're, Oh, rather, I think you're supposed to feel conflicted about him because like, I think it's clear he loved his daughter. Yeah. But, But also at the same time, I think he's kind of aware that she was a witch. So like, and interestingly, it's maybe a comparable relationship. If you are going to go with that article that I'll link to and talk about how this, you know, the relationship between this character and like the sexual act is maybe mirrors something akin to like trauma, right? Yeah. Like abuse. You can maybe compare like the father as like 
carrying that on as well. He's clearly isolated from everybody. He's like looking through her possessions. He seems like traumatized by something, you know? Because even when he says, my daughter's a witch, he doesn't react with like righteous indignation. He just kind of dismisses him in a way that's not entirely convincing of the fact that he doesn't agree with that or that like it matters to him. You know, it's hard to get a read on him, but he just seems like kind of wounded. He certainly doesn't seem like a manly man. No. Yeah. Well, he seems, he just kind of seems like an old defeated noble at this point, kind of. But defeated in relationship to his like daughter. Yeah. So it's weird. It's like, you know, maybe that's just another way of, since you're, that's not what you'd expect from the head Cossack, right? Maybe that's another way of saying that the spirit <laughs> is like, oh, the great doves moment. The best one is coming up, though. <laughs> and, and the way the guy shuts that door is so amazing. This is just such a great slapstick movie. This set, they have though. such good, such good gags. This is the best, though. I'm going to lick my finger. Open the book. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I love it. Oh, it's perfect. And he plays it perfectly, too. But, yeah, what we were saying, oh, so it, maybe this is another way of saying, like, you know, the spirit of this mysticism, if it is truly represented by this girl, is also something that dominates the guy who's in charge, right? So it's like, if we are okay with having this female character be this amorphous like metaphor thing instead of an actual person, yeah. which I think this movie is kind of on board with. If we do look at it that way, um, you know, you could see it as being like the heart of this thing that then corrupts everything, even from the top down, you know? And then maybe you look at the father as also just a different type of victim in this, you know? And that he's like kind of internalized and been corrupted as a Cossack by this spirit of evil, right? Whatever that is. And maybe you can conflate the spirit of evil with the type of like mystical feminine consumerism, you know? It is also interesting to note how like as the plot progresses, he does also get offered rewards and everything, and the punishment changes too for his behavior. So his motivations are different and become more consumerist. He will get a thousand gold coins if he does this, even though it's something that he should do anyway, because he's been ordered by the head priest. Yeah. Even though it's something he's he should a man do anyway. of the cloth. He should yeah. be, <laughs> you shouldn't take money for this, but also if you don't do it, you'll get a thousand lashes. <laughs> right. So there's also like this weird stratification of like motivations too. There's now it's been become consumerist motivating be his behavior. By the way, we should just mention that this stuff is great. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Flying around the church in your coffin. It's just a fun image. It, no, this entire, every scene in the church is just like. It's great. It's wonderful to watch. How can you not enjoy it? And I really, it, it is weird to say this, but I think the interplay between the actors is really good. I think he's really good at interacting with the spooky props. I think he does a great comedic performance. And she's really good at like, also playing it kind of tongue in cheek. Yeah. Neither one of them overplays it, but they also both completely sell the tone and make it really entertaining. They both completely buy their characters that they're playing. Like, I mean, she's just playing like dead, scary witch mime. So like, but no, like I, I genuinely do feel that like this man is drunk off his ass and scared and doesn't really know what to do. But, but also that he's just fucking goofy. Yeah. It does really remind me a lot of kind of like the same attitude of like Bruce Campbell in the Evil Dead movies. He fucking throws his shoe at it. Like that's, uh, that's definitely like a very deliberate joke, you know? So definitely this movie is trying to make you be like, oh, this, this is humorous, right? It's kind of uh, taking the piss out of this a little bit. Oh, and then she curses him to make his hair white. And he's blind. At least temporarily. Yeah. But his hair, that doesn't that doesn't go back. Well, yeah, he just give him a dye job. And again, it is you can maybe see that as like 
akin to what they're talking about with the hunter, how he got like dried up or whatever, and then became a shell of himself. It's like yeah. turns his hair white, ages him prematurely, right? So again, the uh, you know the attack on him is it renders itself physically. You know, it's like bodily penetration, sort of. And you can maybe see that as like you know the stuff with the circle, right? They don't want her to like penetrate the circle and like you know touch him you know that's what it is it's the physical proximity so like you know the threat of her is rendered in very like physical terms and in you know not straightforward physical terms like i'm gonna kill you but like weird physical terms like i'm gonna jump on your shoulders and ride around and we'll fly so it becomes weird too but also spiritual in a way it's like it's a mixture of those things yeah well, it's like her, because we're never really sure what kind of mysticism she believes, and it's not like generic devil worship. It's not like we don't know. As far as we can tell, this is the same church type of religion. Kind of, yeah, but as, like as the otherwise, why would they go to that seminary school? Oh no, I'm saying like it's. I I think these people. Oh, and, you mean in the way she's a deviant? Yes. Yeah. What like the the witchcraft is never it it's nondescript. It's just like. This, yeah. th- this is her mis- yeah, her mischievous mystical powers. But um and then maybe you can also see this as a type of attempt to reassert some type of control or something. Some of sort of engagement in the culture almost. Um but like a Cossack idea. It's hard to mm-hmm. like know unless you're knowing exactly what the cultural expectations would be of like that type of dance or like a man doing it or something. People are laughing to think it's funny, but I'm not sure why, aside from the fact that he's dancing <laughs> and just that that's inherently funny. Although I do admire that he has the energy to do that. You can dance for a long time. I can barely fucking breathe after talking into this microphone for a podcast. <laughs> oh, this is funny. Take my hair off. <laughs> oh, no one's laughing anymore. <laughs> and those other guys feel their hair. <laughs> Hey, he looks just like us. Now, do you think there's a turn with that close-up of the other older Cossack in terms of what they think about him? I think they might start to believe that he's actually, like, experiencing bad shit and he's not just, like, some slacker who wants to... I think they want to believe that, but I also wonder if they're suspicious now, too, right? Is there like a transference of like weird Did other... Did this guy do something wrong? Or? Is there weird othering going on? Clearly when they talk about the hunter, there is, again, like you're saying, a type of consensual interaction with yeah. the way in which, you know, he lets the daughter ride him, right? Yeah. And maybe that makes them like suspicious of like, oh God, don't get your fucking pixie dust on me. I don't want that to happen. And then we're talking about how that she he's confronting her with the fact that she's a witch and that <laughs> the the father's just sort of like yeah i know whatever i don't care which is we we brought this up briefly before but do you think it's a malicious thing do you think it's he's generally doing this out of love for his daughter do you think it's a sort of vengeance thing if we're reading this in the sexual aspects is it like he's trying to avenge the purity of his daughter, even though she was never really pure to begin with. What, what kind of context do we want to read that in? Hmm. Do you hear anything or I don't know. I'm just looking at some of my notes. Cause I feel like there's something that I missed that I wanted to mention. Okay. Well, at least in my take of that, um, if we do want to go with the reading I was bringing up before of the, because this movie was made at a time, like I said, where this yeah, promiscuity was trying to be clamped down on the sexual yeah, in the Soviet Union. So if we want to talk about the cultural moment this movie was made in, then I can sort of get the portrayal of the older character, like accepting that his daughter had a part in this, but also wanting to see the man suffer for it as well, regardless of whether or not it's the right thing to do. That's another thing that I didn't even think of is like, oh, is there an assumption on the man's part that he participated in this as well? And that for somehow he also is responsible 
or contributes to his daughter dying. Well, I think that's partially implied by the fact that like she called for him by name, right, in the village. And even though he's like a, no, yeah, he just graduated. He's like a no name friar, but well, he's a philosopher, Max. Let's be real here. That's high above friars. And but look, he he looks genuinely defeated and sad. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is an interesting relationship. And also just if you're talking about like that sort of thing um, and the, like the idea of sexual promiscuity, right? So the other weird thing about this is like you could definitely, definitely read. Basically what we're talking about is you can relate the idea of that encounter as almost like a type of femme fatale encounter, only he's not so straightforwardly seduced. Yeah. He's only made vulnerable to the quote unquote seduction because he's decadent in other ways. And it's almost like a wrong man situation, but he has no way. It's not really that he's afraid of the performance of having to enact these different social codes and behave in a certain way. So he doesn't seem guilty. It's just that he has no power to extricate himself from the results of being guilty of this because he did not have convictions in the first place. So he's stuck either way. And it doesn't matter how well he performs that he's like guilty or not guilty. It doesn't matter how many times he lies or how he tries to get out of it. There's nothing he can do. He's stuck in it. And the only way he could get out of this is if he genuinely had conviction in the ideology of the institution he belongs to. Right. But he doesn't. And then thus there's no way for him to get out. So he is kind of fated to, to the result of this movie. He's fated to fail. <laughs> and he, he finally makes the decision of actually attempting to run away as opposed to haphazardly sort of doing it. Like he's been doing the entire movie. He's just going to fucking sprint. Yeah. Can I ask you, does this movie like readily like remind you of any other horror movies like immediately? Um, aesthetically, it reminds me of some of the Hammer era Dracula films, but that's just more like the sure. interaction, like, I don't know, the the sets and the way people interact with them more than the content of the film. What about you? Um, I definitely see that because it seems like a similar type of production, even yeah. though, you know... I think this movie has a more specific tone than any of those, but definitely in terms of production value and the, like the scope of it, it, it feels a little bit similar to me. Um, I don't like, it reminds me of other types of like, I don't know how to call it like rural horror, but like rural in the sense of like, Oh, it's the dog again. Um, rural in the sense of like, uh, like maybe paranoia about like a rural community that is outside of civilization kind of on its own. So maybe something like the wicker man, huh? you know, I guess I can see that. I don't know what the term for it would be. R- rural is not a good way to An do it. Isolated because, community almost. Like- yeah. Cause rural is like, because it also has to do with a certain type of occultism too. It's not just the fact that it's isolated. It's that it's these people belong to a society with certain codes that then invoke something weird or supernatural or crazy. Yeah. Right. Um, what's a, what would be another example of a film like that? I feel like the wicker man is a good example of that type yeah. of movie. Um, I should know others. I mean, I guess to, to a degree, the Hills of eyes, but like that's in a different kind of way. Um, Oh man, I would say that's totally different because I feel like that's just the family dynamic. It's, family it's not di- like a society, it's, but it's like the family forming its own society almost. But it, yeah, no, that's completely different. I, I understand the sentiment yeah. you're trying to evoke, and it's different. But I was just thinking, thinking out loud. Uh, but well, we, okay. we haven't talked about a lot because we're just building up to the the final yeah, church scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to talk about some other just? briefly pepper in some other Soviet films that we've seen and how this compares to that in terms of, Oh, I mean, did we talk about how this is different than, or why they don't like mysticism? No, no, I don't think we have actually. Okay. Well, well they don't <laughs> by the way. Yes. So, so that, they don't like witchcraft. That there's not a lot of mysticism or mystical things or religious things in a lot of Soviet film. 
unless it's to show how terrible and corrupt and bad it is. But there uh, are exceptions to the rule, but this is the rule, and yeah. it's very definitively a rule. Um, which that comes from Soviet philosophy, which is based off of obviously Marxist thinking. Marx was not a fan of religion, if you're familiar with his work. He famously called it the opiate of the masses and viewed it as a distraction of, from the upper classes used to keep the lower classes peaceful in this life and a promise that they'll be rewarded in the next life, which he found preposterous. Uh, the Soviets adopted that wholeheartedly. Uh, famously, Lenin and Stalin kicked the Eastern Orthodox Church out of Russia when they were in power. Khrushchev slowly let them back. Um, but it was never really fully accepted when the Soviet Union was still in power. And also when you're trying to create this new country and a new set of ideals, you also want to banish mysticism that's associated with previous uh, times of the Romanov dynasty, which is why that you never didn't really see like Baba Yaga or traditional Soviet or Russian yeah, mythos portrayed a lot in Soviet it, film. It, yeah. At least in terms of the main cultural conversation and yeah. the conversation they were trying to regulate. We're not saying like those things didn't exist, but no, definitely they attempted to regulate culture to a very it wasn't, extreme degree. Yeah. It wasn't going to be in state sponsored yeah, film productions like this, which is why, right. why this is an interesting movie to talk about. And the fact that they would bottle film production into like state, sponsored things like yeah. there's a period of time in soviet filmmaking where really there's only one critic <laughs> and that's stalin <laughs> right and he is the guy who says yes or no and you ho should hope that he says yes and if he says no i mean hopefully it's well, just not stalin, too bad for you stalin <laughs> was historical yeah historically terribly hypocritical with that where he would like have artists killed and have their careers ruined. We're going to send you the gulags because he's yeah. a homosexual. Isn't that gross? Stuff like that. But like, he was also a huge fan of like American cowboy films. Like he was like, fuck Stalin. Honestly, we can, we can argue about a lot of figures in the Soviet union, but like, I don't think you're going to get many like arguments. <laughs> you, there. Well, the internet is a hellhole, So like in some leftist, somebody will come to his defense in some leftist circles. You have people being like, Oh, actually no. I'm just like, yeah, Go away. Go hang out with Candace Owens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, with the wings of a bat. Yes. And now we have the culmination of the film. The the final. Sorry. That, it's, it's so powerful. This My is headphones are so blown great. off. You know what? Oh, Spooky, skeleton. scary skeleton. <laughs> I love this so much. Oh, in the book, in the story, this is lame as shit. It's basically like three sentences. Yeah, but... And this is like way better. This is just great. Oh, look at that. Some weird like Hydra looking thing with Hydra like... skeletons. Cow like skull, skulls on it. Oh, it's so amazing. And um, demon hands reaching out of the wall and like, oh, look at this. This is fun. You can say that this maybe looks... Ooh, I don't even know what that that is. It's just like a ferret looking creature. <laughs> And that looks great. The two noses. That's awesome. This stuff is just fantastic. And then all the set changes. Um, and, you know, they're saying vampires and werewolves, although I don't think that's really the same thing. That could be a <laughs> as translation we would, thing. As we would say. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's just supposed to be like creatures of the night. Yeah, yeah. It's ghouls and goblins and, you know, goth kids and <laughs> all, all other sorts of horrifying <laughs> things. Sorry, there was some tweet. Oh, that guy, the shadow of him, he had a goat head. Oh, man, this is great. And you could totally tell why he says, like, you know, people would compare this guy to Ray Harryhausen. I mean, it looks great. Uh, all this stuff is fantastic. Well, yeah, well, as we were saying, the guy got his start in animation. So, like, it makes sense that he would use a lot of stuff like this. But Yeah, and... um you know, it's really unfortunate how that really just stops with the title character of this movie, V. I don't know if we've even mentioned this yet. V is the name of the fucking ultimate demon she's going to summon. Yeah. Who looks like a fucking... I love that skeleton. He looks like a bloated baby rhino elephant combined with just like <laughs> a fucking sludge monster. He just looks like ass. He sucks. He reminds me of... Uh... They're like scared of him. When she mentions his name. I don't know why he doesn't look that similar, but for whatever reason in my mind, it reminds me of a, what's that tree monster from like the, 
the from Hence? hell from hell it came. Oh, he does kind of look like that, especially on the poster. Yeah, on the poster, but he just looks you know. like a fucking dumbass. You know, I hate it. <laughs> it is very anticlimactic for him, and he just looks like it. Just I don't know. It it is. Fortunately, this movie is goofy, but I feel like you're seeing all this like effects, and it just doesn't quite. Not that I'm like really disappointed because it is goofy, but it's like wow, I I thought that would be maybe cooler looking. Now, one thing you could maybe compare it to in terms of like folk ish type of horror stories is the idea of it being similar to like the golem story, right? Maybe yeah. that's reminiscent of that, but really like, you know, you could even find a way to do that and make it look, look more like crazy and awesome. I bet. You know what? No, I'm, I'm going to apologize to from hell. It came the monster from in from hell. It came looks better than that. Like, that that's bad which is sad because like the rest of the goofy ghouls and goblins look great and here we have this weird disturbing moment where the demons devour him yes you know which is creepy when you think of it as like the resulting of this like sexual thing you know it is weirdly his punishment is finally yeah his punishment either for the sexual transgression or maybe just being too weak to stay true to the word of god yeah and save himself Either way, it, it does play out kind of like a morality play where he's guilty. And then, again, you know, the daughter is transformed back into the, the witch. And because they they did not hear the first uh, cock of the crow, um, or crowing of the cock, excuse me, whatever fucking order goes in. I don't live on a farm. Fuck Title you, people. Title of my sex tape. Fuck you, people who are pedantic with your goddamn rooster terms. Your farm animal sounds fuck off um, you should be lucky that you have the technology to listen to a podcast you farmers anyway <laughs> what was that rant where i don't know i don't know where that came from uh feeling aggressive all of a sudden <laughs> i don't know why i'm sorry people uh but but yes so they get stuck in the the church is in disorder because they did not hear the rooster and the sun came up and it revealed everything or something. He was telling the truth the entire time. and Yes. And here we see that he was fated to die. And this is really where we get well, like... One of them doesn't even believe he's dead. like, Or they don't know. I yeah. mean, it definitely does hit the nail on the head in terms of this being the morality play. They're like updating yeah. this fresco and they're like, oh, he should have listened. And again, these are the two guys from the beginning, but they are also shown as sort of absorbing a moral from his behavior by the fact that they are more dutiful in their, in, you know, being like seminary students. I mean, it is interesting. They're drinking, they're taking a break to drink, but they are updating this. We see them at work. They're updating the fresco. Right. So it's like, it, it, it's like they, they have taken their change, their behavior and we're seeing it with our own eyes. Right. Yeah. And it is kind of reinforcing the idea that this movie is capped with a moral and it's kind of a morality play, maybe. Even though they are debating it. Definitely whatever Coma did to get into his situation, he's wrong. Maybe they imagined it. By the way, random question. Have you ever had borscht? I have not. Well, neither have I, and I have no interest in it. We should have gotten a flask of vodka for this so we could take a drink every time they do in the movie so we would just be belligerent by the end of it. No. That's not fun. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear us when we're like entirely cogent and like as like intelligently speaking as we possibly can. But yeah. So yeah, this this is kind of the most blatant like look, this is morality play and this is what happened and this is where he went wrong or what should have he done. But that's the end of V, though. Well, we're not done yet, Max. We kind of are. I mean, we pretty much are. <laughs> we'll keep, keep working. working, then. And maybe they will have changed. But definitely this movie sells it on me as being like a morality play. Whatever the opinion is, definitely the movie does not want you to identify with Koma too much because... Yeah, well, he's, it's only to identify you to scare you about your own behavior. I think I think th it's hard for it to for you to even possibly relate to him because he's kind of a shitty person. He's, throughout he's such all an of asshole. It. But yeah. again, since it is like you know allegorical, kind of, it's relating to an aspect of a person more so than like 
an actual individual. And I guess that is, if I had to really arrive at like a subtextual conclusion about this movie, I think I would say that it is more the second thing I mentioned earlier, where it's like kind, it's light propaganda, but in the sense that it is thematically at a very fundamental level, trying to like regulate that hedonistic consumerist urge in people by saying, don't go too far now. Yeah. Don't embrace that too much. I can see that. Because then you'll be, you know, you'll be, you'll, you're abandoning yourself to the mysticism of these other, you know, you know, tiger cultures that are different and they'll corrupt you and they'll weaken you, you know, they'll um, weaken your strong socialist resolve. Oh. Yeah. And it might seduce you in the way that like a woman would, it might seem like appealing or weird, but if you continue with, if you follow that behavior too much, you will open yourself to being vulnerable to that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm hesitant to come to any definitive conclusions. Same I, here. I find it to be much more entertaining to just speculate on the nature of the film rather than and I, I try think, to, unfortunately that's mostly what we have the ability to. I mean, yeah. we, we, it's not like we go all out with research where we're going to write a fucking dissertation on every movie we do, but we'll Google it or something. And there's, but there's only so much information out there about this movie. It's definitely the type of movie that has more fan involvement and commentary on it than it does like academic or historical like documentation of, yeah. of, of like what happened in this movie. There are some, and it is a shame. There are know? some notable critical, the uh, interp like or just acknowledgements of this, but there's not a whole lot, especially compared to some other prolific yeah, Soviet films, but there are other Soviet films of this time that definitely got out yeah. more. And, um, I, you know, again, I think I can't remember which source it was, but I don't, I didn't even get the impression that this left the country even at the time when it was opening itself up more, I got the impression it didn't really go anywhere unless it was like, you know, sent out, not in any official means. Right. And then it was like released somehow to, you know, other countries, maybe on home video or something later. But yeah, I don't think this movie really saw it was seen anywhere in mass outside of the Soviet union until decades after, I don't think. So, you know, it's hard to go back and find in information on it, but it's definitely a very interesting movie. And again, as far as we can tell, the only Soviet horror movie. So now only we still wide, only one that's widely available, but um, yeah. And maybe there were ones that were silent that maybe were lost or something. Cause there's a lot of lost movies yeah. that are silent. So, but this is widely available. You can find it on YouTube. We'll include that in the show notes. So yeah, uh, we encourage you guys to watch it. It's only like 70 something minutes long. It's fun. It's a good party movie. And uh, yeah, there's some interesting stuff to think about as well. Some interesting questions. So it is definitely unique. So I'm glad we did it on the show, Max. I feel like we did as, as good of a job talking about it as we possibly could. Yeah, same. Um, if you want to hear us talk about other movies, we are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and our website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We try to upload every week, so we'll have a plethora of different movies for you guys to check out. You sound um, like you're talking like a flight attendant. <laughs> That's my customer service voice. Do you like it? We are now going to ask you to <laughs> stop listening so you miss the, the awful jokes that are going to come.